Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jo, Senior Director of Arts and Culture, and we're coming to you live once again from my home. Many of you may have heard the great news about our annual dinner, which will be conducted online this October. Among the three recipients of the Van Fleet Award, the highest honor from the Korea Society is none other than BTS. BTS has conquered Western music charts and social media on their way to becoming the biggest band in the world. With record breaking firsts and three Billboard number one album within a year, their music and messaging has gone on to transcend the limitation of language, geography, and genre. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome back Tamar Herman, one of America's leading authorities on K-pop and East Asian entertainment. Her book, which was just published yesterday, is titled BTS, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. In it, she goes behind the scenes of today's biggest pop band, focusing on the members, the music, and the fans, and bringing the extraordinary story of BTS to life. Tamar Herman is a New York City-based journalist specializing in international music and media with a focus on American Asian pop culture and market and its trends. In addition to her role as pop correspondent at Billboard, she has written for other outlets, including NBC News, Forbes, and Entertainment Weekly, and appears in the K-pop episode of Vox Explained docuseries on Netflix. Welcome back to the Korea Society, Tamar. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on your book. Thank you, and thanks for having me. It's always wonderful joining you guys at the Korea Society. Thanks for coming. So um, let's talk about BTS, which yes. is the topic <laughs> of your book. So yes. Let's start from the very beginning, or shall we say the origin story. Um, <laughs> take us back to 2013 when BTS made the official debut in, mm -hmm. in South Korea, or actually, I guess it would be a few years before that, before the official debut. How did it all begin? Yeah, so BTS, for anyone who isn't familiar, they debuted on June 13, 2013, um, with their single, No More Dream. And they debuted with this, you know, very powerful hip hop based song about, you know, pursuing your dreams as a youth of you know, the era. And they, the seven members of the group were put together by this company, Big Hit Entertainment, which kind of got its name in South Korea because of its producer and founder, Bang Shiak, who used to work with JYP Entertainment, which you might know if you're unfamiliar with him, just his name. He's produced songs for many Korean icons like Big Ji Young and um, Wonder Girls and he, you know, Park Jin Young himself. And so he moved from JYP to start his own place. And originally the company was kind of focused on uh, like some vocal pop groups. So if you're familiar with 8 and 2AM, they were under big hit. And in 2013, BTS was their first uh, boy band and they were kind of trying to do something new. And instead of, you know, focusing on vocal pop, they were focusing on a more hip hop, hip hop based crew. And the group kind of was brought together over a few years. So the first member who joined was BTS's RM, who is uh, one of their main rappers and songwriters. And he was uh, part of the underground hip hop scene. And he kind of got introduced to Bang Shiak who saw the potential of RM and said, I'm gonna create a hip hop based group to kind of fit into the idol scene and see like what we can do. And so from, from then pretty much, BTS kind of was formed over the years. Originally it was a little bit more hip hop. There were some former potential BTS members. Um, and then we got by June, 2013, we got the seven men that we know today. So three members. RM, J-Hope, and Sugo, who are rappers, and then the four members, Jin, V, Jimin, and Jungkook, who, you know, are the vocalists, and there's some singing from the rappers and some rapping from the singing, so there's overlap, and over the years, you know, they just went from kind of being this group under this pretty small, pretty new company to being the biggest thing South Korea has ever produced when it comes to pop music, so I guess sigh, but size in his own league um so bts started they you know they started out pretty small they started out kind of with their hip-hop image and over the years they've tried out different things and they still always have a really strong hip-hop 
styling to some of their music, but over the years they've also kind of become more popish and they've kind kind of tried out some new experimental styles for themselves and some storytelling elements that were brought into their their world, like their musicality to create their own creative universe that interplays with their music and their artistry. And now by the time, you know, we're in 2020, since 2013, seven years later, BTS kind of really has their own, you know, existence um, in, in this world, both regarding their music and their presence. So let's talk about 2013, um, specifically when they first mm -hmm. made a debut, because my understanding is that it wasn't like they, Easy. you know, they weren't, <laughs> They weren't who they are now, obviously. No. Um, it was a bit of a struggle for them to really catch attention. Can you tell us a little bit about what was sort of the K-pop scene was like yeah. in 2013? Uh, yeah, both in Korea, because you mentioned a lot of things about them being really wanting to do something with hip-hop because of mm. the three rappers. Um, and also outside of Korea, what was in, um, going on in terms of the K-pop's popularity outside of yeah. Korea? So 2013 was kind of a breakthrough year for Korean music because Psy had just blown up. So 2012, 2013 is when Psy was really getting everywhere to the world. Between around 2008 and 2012, when Psy's Gangnam Style eventually came out and then, you know, became a thing, uh, K-pop was doing really well internationally as a niche market. So after YouTube became a popular, you know, form of streaming and entertainment, groups like Wonder Girls and Super Junior, Girls Generation, that whole 21, Big Bang, that whole generation of K-pop, which was kind of cemented at the end of the, 20, uh, the 2000s, kind of by 2013, there were them and then a whole other generation of artists who had followed them. So in 2013, you had major hits by groups like Shiny and Girls Generation and Tiara and C Sistar and Secret and you know 2AM and, and the scene was full. Everyone was putting out something, everybody was having hits. K-pop was had a really sizable um, audience throughout the world, not necessarily in the US, but you know, K-pop was huge. Girls' Generation won uh, an, an award for, from the YouTube Music Video Awards, like they beat out every top star in the world for I Got A Boy's music video being considered the best music video of 2013. K-pop in 2013 was a very saturated industry. It seemed like the industry was finally reaching lucrative heights to really kind of become a power of music in the world. And, K and BTS arrived on this scene when older acts were still continuing to see success and new acts were coming every single day. And BTS was, you know, they kind of leaned into a popular trend at the time. Hip hop was just really kind of starting to see a moment in Korea. If you're familiar with the, this television show, Show Me the Money. It's a very popular series in South Korea where hip hop artists you know, perform. And it had kind of around 2013, just really seen a lot of major success and hip hop artists were really engaging with the charts in a way, um, in the charts and popularity in a way that hip hop hadn't really seen in a few years in Korea. Uh, Korea had previously seen, you know, some hip hop kind of seeing a boom a few years earlier, you know, groups like Epic High and um, crews like um, Drunken Tiger, who, which, you know, resulted in things like Tiger JK and a bunch of other artists, you know, even SoTG had hip hop in it. But hip hop as like an idea was really kind of in 2013, it was, you know, um, like I remember I was when I was in Korea in 2013, I would turn on the TV and show me the money would always be on replays would always be on if you were like flipping through channels, you'd see it everywhere, or like references to it or the artists would be somewhere. So hip hop was really having a moment. So kind of K-pop was having a moment and hip-hop was having a moment in South Korea. So K-pop was kind of going beyond South Korea and hip-hop was kind of, you know, chilling in Korea for like at the top of the charts for the first time in a while. And BTS arrived with these seven men who were really into, you know, showing the world what they have. And it was a tough scene. So, you know, how can a new crew really gain the attention of a whole audience that is paying attention to all these big stars who are still putting out high quality content and putting out you know stuff that the audience is really receptive to so bts when they first started you know they were just one small group amid a, like a huge crowd and they you know relayed this struggle in the, some of their songs if you listen to their song c they use a metaphor of not being able to like pursue their career they were, the way they wanted, like it's a desert, like they're thirsting for what they want to achieve. And, you know, now 
that they're successful in their songs, they'll often incorporate this metaphor, like it was a desert and now it's a sea. Um, and they've done it because of each other and their audience and their army and, you know, their company that's behind them, that's been supporting them all along. So I think, uh, you know, the, the struggles have really made them what they are today. So let's talk about their music. You've referred to the, this sort of the combo. I mean, if I interpret it correctly, they are sort of the ones who are combining the hip hop and mm -hmm. the K-pop. So, yeah. and usually BTS is referred to as the K-pop band yeah. or K-pop group. So let's talk about what is K-pop anyway? <laughs> and how does BTS's music fits into that genre? Yeah, so uh, you said uh, kind of a touchy word there, which is genre, uh, which is something <laughs> I true. I try not to say with K-pop, but it's, it's, it's obvious, like it's a thing you do is genres, you know, just the catch all, it's easy to say. Uh, but K-pop, I consider it as the industry. So, you know, um, K-pop is, you know, any, I, personally, I consider anything K-pop that's coming out of the South Korean pop established industry. So there is a distinct idea in my brain between K and D and K hip hop and, you know, Korean ballads. I don't typically call K-pop, but if you put them in iTunes under K-pop, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge you that much, uh, maybe a little. Uh, so <laughs> K-pop is kind of um, idols are a really common thing in South in South Korea. They kind of got prominence in Japan. You know, pop idols who are young stars who are usually backed by sizable companies or just any company. And the point of them kind of is to build up their audience. So you're you're creating music and you're performing because you you know you want to be a creative and you want to be a performer. But the the goal is to some degree to create an audience that will like stay with you so nowadays people like taylor swift and ariana grande are kind of similar to south korean idols in a way that you know their goal eventually even if it not initially was to kind of engage specifically with their fandoms and we're seeing this across the board in western media with just general artists are realizing you know it's more beneficial for a career kind of to not only have hit songs on the radio but also to have um, a fandom and so, you know, Lady Gaga with her little monster is like, oh. it's, it's very common. Nicki Minaj has her barbs, you know, fandoms are everything because they help keep you relevant. Even if you, you know, you're not just a one hit wonder if you have fans who are there to support you. So the K-pop like industry is kind of built on Korea itself doesn't have such a huge audience built in, you know, with around 50 million people, South Korea's audience isn't huge enough to really support and sustain music industry. But if you look elsewhere, you're going to hopefully, you know, get a large audience who can help fund this industry. So what Korea did early on was K-pop stars looked to Japan. So stars like BOA and TVXQ early on moved into Japan. And then, um, you know, even earlier than that, HOT was performing in like Beijing, I think. Um, I think it was Beijing, not Shanghai. And so K-pop kind of has always looked internationally. So BTS kind of came at it, um, you know, blending the K-popness, which is, you know, very innovative, very pop-ish based music, but not only pop and destroying in a lot of genres, you know, everyone always comments that So Taeji and Boys was the first uh, like uh, pre-K-pop group really, and is considered the start of K-pop and what they're doing, they were doing was blending performance art with the music and the music was, you know, here's some hip hop and here's some new Jack Swing and here's some pop and here's some R&B and we're just gonna throw in some metal on our next album. Here's some rock. Like there was no genre limitations to what they were doing and there was no really performance limitations to what you're doing. So when you talk about K-pop, I always think it's just the, the choreosonic performance element to it is, the, is a really important thing. So like what keeps somebody from Korea, someone from Korea could be a Korean pop performer and not necessarily K-pop because they're not kind of putting the performance elements things, not putting necessarily the um, industrialized element to things. So K-pop idols aren't necessarily only trying to sing, they're also trying to break into other industries like acting or emceeing or, you know, just generally this is kind of like a launching pad for the career. And so BTS kind of arrived when more and more K-pop groups were kind of starting to move away from that very industrialized sort of thing and start to, you know, um, blend that 
idledom with artistry because the industry has already, had already at that point, you know, become very solidified and things had kind of gone into a point where maturing makes sense. So BTS arrived, um, Dangxia, you know, saw value in a group that has, you know, songwriters in the group who has input in their musicality. And other companies have some members, um, you know, other groups nowadays, like Seventeen, write their own songs also. But BTS kind of was really one of the first that, like the focus was on telling their story. The members, you know, were writing songs even prior. Some of them were writing songs even prior to BTS's debut. And um, it's important, I think, to mention that uh, big hits like slogan um, is music and artist for healing. And so the kind of idea of music being something that can, you know, help is something that I think is really important that you have to consider when thinking um, about big hit and BTS. Uh, because, you know, that was kind of the whole goal. And so um, BTS's music kind of came at this, like, junction, I think, of where Korea's pop, you know, industry was kind of moving past where it had been stagnant, or not stagnant necessarily, but just a point where a lot of stars were there, a lot of good music was coming out. And what do you do next? Once you've already seen success, once you've already, you know, got recognition, you know, groups like Big Bang and 21 were kind of already gaining recognition in the U.S. I guess the um, Girls' Generation was already gaining recognition in the West. So you've gone beyond the prior limitations of, you know, uh, K-pop really only touring in Asia and kind of going. It was now a, a pretty much a global phenomenon. So what, what do you do when the industry is trying to, you know, go further than where it is right now? And so I think BTS is kind of the answer for that. And, it, you know, I wasn't a fly on the wall when they were, you know, figuring out what they wanted to produce, what sort of artists they wanted to produce a big hit, but that kind of seems like the perfect, um, it just kind of makes sense to me. It was the perfect blend of let's put together, you know, these artists who know how to write their own songs and how to, and they have stories that they want to tell and we'll take, you know, um, hip hop, which has a, is having a very strong moment and they have a strong connection to it and we'll take the K-pop, you know, ideal um, so like boy bands that, you know, perform for fans across the world and put them together and we'll create, we'll synthesize something that is going to be new and going to, you know, resonate. And BTS from day one already had a pretty strong following. They were very engaging on social media. They were, you know, um, very involved on YouTube even prior to their debut. They were really building this audience who was kind of like cheering them on. And over the years, even as they've grown and, you know, their music style has changed or matured, they've still always, you know, refer to their earlier stuff, their current album series, the Map of the Soul series, um, you know, harkens back to their earliest days. This recent album, Map of the Soul 7, has several songs that pay um, homage to some of their earlier songs sonically, and they have, you know, a lot of foiling going on in their music. So everything about BTS is kind of telling the story of BTS and telling almost the story of the current, like, existence for youth and telling that through their music and because it's using a, a, a choreosonic art form you don't necessarily need to understand what they're saying it's kind of like when you go to the opera you don't need to understand what they're saying because the opera you, you know the performers are relaying it in a way that it's it's so obvious what they're saying that's the whole point of it um or not the whole point of it but that's what people enjoy about it you don't need to speak you know whatever language it is so i think k-pop I think, sorry, BTS's way of relaying K-pop and, and kind of blending it with the story that they're telling is something that's really unique. And, uh, and it's not to say that other K-pop artists aren't telling stories and that their songs don't, you know, have deeper meanings. Like historically, K-pop acts in the first generation were spending a lot of time rallying against the society. But the way that they started out and the way they've been telling their story all this time and the way they've been sharing their story with the world and kind of being intensely relatable and universal while at the same time very personal uh, is something that I think really makes them stand out. And I think that makes a lot of sense um, given how they were really connect with, especially with youth all around the world actually, right? Um, and be able to do it. But let's go back to sort of their album to Hwayang Yanhua part one, or as it is known in English, uh, <laughs> the most beautiful moment in life part one was released in April, 2015. Um, so two years after their official debut. Uh, in your book, you said with this album, I'm, I'm quoting you, BTS <laughs> oh, went no. from, 
video as, as went from being one of many promising hip hop oriented boy bands in the Korean music scene to one of it, um, one with its own distinct, wholly separate identity. So can you tell us a little bit about this album? And also my understanding is that this is really when that sort of the transmedia storytelling comes into play. Um, if you watch their videos and there's this thing called the BU or it's, um, <laughs> which is Pangtan Universe as for, I'm sure everybody knows this, but BTS stands for Pangtan Sonyeondan in Korean and Pangtan means bulletproof and all that. Um, so this whole transmedia storytelling starts with their lyric, with their music, with their music video and all these things going on. So can you start, can you tell us a little bit more about that album and how they um, started to convey this sort of the storytelling and the message that they had? Yeah, for sure. Also, you're the first person who I've ever heard read my book out loud to me. So that was really, really special. <laughs> was that, was that weird? <laughs> it was really special. Oh, and I'm good. so happy it was that line. Uh, yeah, so BTS, when they arrived on the scene, you know, they were really pulling on their hip hop roots. But at this point, K-pop, um, a few other groups like Block B and BAP were also really doing this. Um, so they weren't, you know, they were part of a whole like kind of crew of new generation of artists who were seeing that this is something that they want to do. And it's there's a viable, like, opportunity for it but with the most beautiful moment in life the first one and then the whole series and all the view and everything else that came out of it really ups the game so now at this point bts um, and big hit and the creative teams there they started building a creative universe that's telling a story that's kind of parallel to bts's musicality with a, a fictionalized version of bts bts's members living this life that is relayed through music videos and social media posts and you know websites and now there's books and they were relaying kind of this the story that was um, exploring the realities for youth and kind of the struggles that people deal with and so as BTS's songs kind of went through this it tied into a lot of themes about you know like you know like um, the book is called Blood, Sweat and Tears and Blood, Sweat and Tears is music video is inspired by the Buildings Roman book uh, Damien by Herman Hess and you know, it's just kind of telling the story, you know, like, like it says, the most beautiful moment of life of which is youth. And so it's how do you explore youth? And how do you relate to youth? And how do you hold on to youth when you've gone past youth? And it's just, um, you know, they kind of made it so that you're not just engaging with the music and their performances as people, you're you're um, engaging with the ideas that they're sharing too. So, you know, you're going to watch the music video and you're going to watch the next music video because you want to know what happens. And so you can watch and engage with pretty much all elements of the BU separately, um, except maybe a few of the social media posts. You'll probably just be pretty lost, but uh, it's continued to this day. So right now they're actually, you know, they're having a, uh, like a kind of choose your own story uh, experience going on on social media every few days they'll post something and fans will get to vote whether they want to answer a or b to something on a twitter poll and then they'll share the next post and it will change the storyline to some degree um, i think they're having a video game that's coming out so you know they really elevated this idea of just being an artist telling their own story and being, sorry, being a musical artist telling their own story or other stories that, you know, they can write about and sing about, but they're also creating a story and they're creating a fictional narrative that runs parallel to them. So they're just as much artists as they are creators, if that makes sense. I feel like that's the same thing, but like in right now, my brain, I should have had more coffee. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so pretty much yeah. like they just, they heightened what it is so you don't need to own or you, you don't only need to know about the BU to love BTS you don't really even need to engage with the BU to love BTS but they are offering something more so it's kind of like um for any uh, Marvel fans here you might be familiar with the Marvel movies and maybe you've watched the like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show and maybe you've read the comic books but only really diehard fans are going to, you know, do them all and like engage with them and what are, sometimes they have websites. And this is something that a lot of media entities, usually fictional ones engage with. BTS is kind of a rare musical artist doing this. So, you know, think about it like Taylor Swift, 
maybe she'll have, you know, her folklore album just came out and she said point blank, this is an album where I'm not only sharing my own story, I'm sharing other people's stories. But she wasn't necessarily engaging with those stories across different media platforms. She wasn't releasing music videos where maybe she, you know, kind of emulated other people. She was pretty much keeping it straightforward media. You're not trying to elevate it. And transmedia marketing, whatever it means, is kind of elevating a media story across different platforms and different and telling it in different ways that will enhance the overall experience. So, you know, personally, the first time I ever encountered the term was when I was a lost fan, uh, which was a terrible decision of my life, but lost had <laughs> um, their TV show and there was a lot of mysteries. So there'd be websites and games and there was things that were involved with it. And BTS kind of, you know, it's not the same like sleuthing sort of thing because they're not trying to, you know, build necessarily a universe that you have to engage in to enjoy BTS music but you know it, when they give a speech they'll often you know drop a hint to the next album series that they're gonna or next album or a song title or something it'll be thrown in there and you know fans will speculate oh maybe this is going to be the album maybe this is going to be the song and then they'll release a music video that will have fans googling references or trying to connect it to previous interactions and then they'll release a book or um, you know do something on social media and so it's really engaging fans and it's really kind of elevating what it means to be engaging with a you know a musical entity in this day and age so it's not you know they've really kind of elevated the experience of what it means to be a fan of you know a boy band which sounds incredibly complicated well not complete very complex and Mm -hmm. um very well thought out and it began way back in well way back in 2015 which feels like (laughs) lifetime ago but um (laughs) how much of it do you think was in the plan or i mean obviously you know they're they were young men and as they grew i'm sure they all mature then they changed and everything too and so did probably the people who are helping them to grow Mm. as artists and, and as performers but how much do you think it was planned out, so to speak? Or is it just a, a simple idea that really began and then, you know, as time went on, they just were able to somehow manage it incredibly well and also really stick to that sort of the core message? Is that, and maybe that's why they are so success, successful. But do do you think, I mean, really there was this grand plan or they just wanted to really tell this very specific story that they were interested in? So part of me, I still really don't know. And I don't know if we'll ever know because unless someone goes on the record saying that. um, I've asked and I've spoken to big hit creators before and they've never, you know, said, oh yeah, we have this whole thing mapped out. To some degree, there has to be some awareness that it's going to keep continuing because, you know, they released the book, the notes one, it was the one um and then there's more to come so there is some sort of long-term vision for what they're going to share with the world who really knows you know if it was just going to be the most beautiful moment of life series and then they decided to expand that beyond Uh, we're really not going to know unless they tell us themselves Uh, the creatives will tell us the bts will tell us you know i think i think personally i think it was seen as a really good way to tell their story to relay what they wanted to share with the world in kind of an enhanced medium. And, um, you know, Bang Shiak, their producer, he has, uh, I believe he has a degree in uh, literature. I'd have to double check that. Um, But he's always been someone who's very active in in using different like art references into their work. So, you know, even the most beautiful moment in life, the title is actually the same as Wong Kar Wai's I did not the have movie. enough coffee. Yes, the movie. Mm. What's the movie called? Um, <laughs> the uh, In the Mood for Love, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm no, 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 no. Late in the day. Um, clearly didn't have enough coffee. Uh, so yeah, so In the Mood for Love. So there's a lot of like anybody who see, anybody who's familiar with that film and um, it was a really popular film in Asia, especially. So you're going to see that title and they use specifically the Chinese characters for that. Um, right, st- right. that that album series so you're gonna it's gonna resonate and you're gonna start thinking of that film and what that film meant kind of as an idea and to you and you're gonna then look to the series and they've continued this throughout there's always hints there's always something kind of going to be referenced there's always going to be something that you're going to be thinking about and I think it's really um, 
so wonderful because you're enhancing the experience of engaging with art. And it's not just what like, it's not just a singular direction with artists giving art to audiences, but it's audience. It's a way to bring audience in and engage. And I think, mm. um, I think, I, I really don't know. <laughs> I really do not know what what if there is an end goal. Like part of me is like, there must be an end goal. Like there there is a cutoff to when they're gonna stop with this storyline, or you know, at least get to some sort of place where things are you know solidified and there's an end. Um, but uh, I don't know if that is coming anytime soon or if they even really have a plan for that. But I, I, I believe they do some of what they've done. You know, it, it just kind of you, you'll see it a few years later. Part of me is like, oh, I think that they probably, you know, see something a few years later that they've previously referenced and then work it into things. But I really think the creators of this BU mm. and everybody who has worked on it is just like really elevated the art form of popdom and just the way we interact with pop art. But not only that they elevated the art mm. form, but what I found really interesting, especially from the very beginning, very early on in their career is their honesty about mm. emotions. And um, especially when they are talking about, you know, anxiety and loneliness and mental health of youth. Um, and I say that because in Korea, even now, or I, I guess it is the case wherever, if you really think about it, mental health issues has such stigma. And it is not something that you usually hear a lot about, or not until recently. I think mm -hmm. we are, especially given the time we are living through, I think there's a lot more focus on that. But really from even that in, in 2015, they were very mm -hmm. honest talking about not just, you know, the, the beauty of being youth, but also mm -hmm. the the difficulty of being youth um, and talking about especially anxiety and loneliness. And I am mm -hmm. sort of jumping a little ahead because of that <laughs> famous meet speech that RM made at the UN yeah. in 2018 when um, they were invited to give a, a speech there, which was which surprised a lot of people, I think, because he was mm -hmm. so honestly talking about mental health issues and then you even interviewed a psychoanalyst for your book <laughs> um, talk to talk so I'm gonna leave that to the viewers to actually read about it because it's incredibly complicated and we don't have enough time to really delve into it but this their willingness to sort of explore mm. this issue which is I think something that I find really refreshing and different uh, maybe from other uh, K-pop group that were before, um, they sort of mention it or they may refer to these things, mm -hmm. but it was never really there. Um, what do you think? I mean, obviously, maybe it is their hip-hop background, but what do you think mm -hmm. made them up to really open up to this issue? Uh, I think um, that art kind of in general is used by many artists to not only just relay like a general moment or feeling it's used to relay feel, like the emotions that a person is experiencing or po like the political view or sociological view so um you know yeah you can make a van like a, a van gogh starry night that's gonna you know just be a beautiful picture or you can do a van gogh self-portrait that's gonna kind of show something about the artist himself and i think bts for much of their career have kind of been doing that self portrait thing and then they also have some starry nights where um even from like day one they were talking about you know the struggles of youth generally like no more dream and and no these songs kind of dealt with what youth is dealing with with like the future looming overhead and feeling like the generation before them hasn't really prepared us and, you know um I always think of like um, the youth nowadays who are dealing with climate change and going in front of the world and saying like, can you please stop ruining it because we're not gonna have a planet. Um, and I kind of think of BTS in that way, like they're using the art form and the popularity of, of, of K-pop in a way to kind of relay the things that mean the most to them. And, and I, think the, I think Big Hit as a company does this this is kind of like the formation, as I mentioned before, the company's slogan is music and artists for healing. And I think that's really something that comes into play here where they, you know, BTS isn't just, you know, it's not just a boy band that's kind of performative. They're bringing in the experiences to say something. 
And uh, I think some artists do this. Well, I mean, many artists do this. So that's music. You know, you could you could just be a general pop song, or you could be a, a pop song that has like intense meaning and stuff. And I think um, you know another artist who does this really well is Lady Gaga. Um, everything is universal, but then you feel something from it. <laughs> um, so I think BTS kind of are, you know, uh, obviously every every performer is an artist, but I think, you know, the idea of being like artistic and being like, <laughs> I always think this is very like um, a me thing because I was just in Paris, but I always think like if they had the chance, BTS would be hanging out in Paris in like the 1800s in the artistic salons, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, like in the, in the 1900s when like all like the Western canon was kind of being solidified by like everyone there and I just think that like that's the sort of artistic I wouldn't say environment that their music is being created and in the way that they're kind of almost like being reared as artists is they're at a company that this is the whole goal so they're going to put out things that align with this goal and align with their own personal feelings and I just think um I'm I'm very much more succinct in the book but I think that um I think that this is just something that, you know, when you have something you want to say and something you want to do, there's not much that's going to stop you from saying it and trying to do it. And I think BTS have been very successful in in saying and trying to do things that, you know, kind of shake the world and make people who hear them think. So even during the um, UN speech, the, you know, speak yourself, the idea of like, being a advocate for yourself. That was something that um, RM re- referenced an earlier song. So they've been doing this, you know, for years. They've been kind of, I, I almost like want to say it's kind of, they've been performing the songs that they want to hear and they want other people to hear. And, you know, that's what mm-hmm. art is all about. You want someone to see your vision and you want someone to understand your creativity and, and engage with it and think about it. And I think they've just really enhanced what we think of pop music film. And then, as you mentioned, there's always this series of albums that they release. Mm-hmm. So the Hyang Yanwa part two, or the most beautiful one in life part two was released on November 30th, 2015. I mm-hmm. you even had the um, <laughs> date down. And then in 2016 came the part three, the most beautiful mm-hmm. woman in life, young forever. Yay. This is and when, BTS also not only um, they were becoming big in Korea, they were beginning to break into the American market as well. And we're not gonna. Yes. And I, I know we actually have some um, viewers who are watching actually from all over the world, just judging Ooh. from their email addresses. But I'm we're just going to focus on the American market because if we open it up to the whole world, I know that's well, we one hour is not enough to cover everything. Um, but we always hear about how inventive they are using social mm-hmm. media. You just mentioned some of the ways they, you know, give the, their uh, fans a hint of what's coming up and things like that. But you also emphasize the importance of concert tours um, and how they were just c- constantly performing here. <laughs> and touring. Um, mm-hmm. And that really started, I guess, in the late 2015 early 2016 and it until recently that's what they were doing they were just it seemed like they were everywhere um in this day and age where everybody can you know talk to each other like this over the internet how important was the concerts and how important was that sort of personal connection with their fans I think it was Uh, I wouldn't say it was necessarily the be all and end all because you could be a fan and never see an artist in person, but there's something about being in the same space as someone who you love and engaging with them and feeling that intimate connection. Like even as much as I'm enjoying the virtual concerts that are happening, including, you know, BTS just had their Bang Bang Con live a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, what month is it? Um, (laughs) uh, It's all blending in together. There is something about the kinetic energy of being in the room with a performer and watching the performance and and knowing that, you know, you're kind of in the space of this person who you've drawn immense energy and um, inspiration from. And I think that BTS kind of going 
to do tours in places at the time that they started touring you know not a, a lot of k-pop groups kind of did big tours so they it, the kind of the theory at the time was only the biggest groups could tour you could like big bang and 21 touring maybe once a year maybe in new york maybe in la um, but the idea that smaller K-pop groups could be lucrative and touring in the U.S. was something that really very few people were doing. So a few other counterparts at this point kind of realized, oh, there's, you know, there's an audience here and BTS was one of them. And I, um, I, I do always wonder whether maybe kind of because they're, they were early on, you know, being very heavily by influence, influenced by hip hop, there was some desire to, you know, kind of tap into the audience that is, you know, hip hop's hip hop's forty seventh anniversary was yesterday. <laughs> um, it was created in New York, the Bronx, uh, which BTS has referenced before at City Field. It was the coolest mm-hmm. moment of my life. Um, so I think that the um, the idea of touring regularly is important, just you know, because fans want to experience that. And artists, it's you know, you elevate what you're doing with tours, and and also, of course. To be clear, touring is the way that artists make the most money. That's really the only way artists make money aside from ads. So if you're at a point in your career where maybe you're not getting ad deals, touring is a great way to start things and build your audience and to kind of engage with them. So early on, BTS was touring pretty regularly in the US. They were here, I don't want to say all the time, but they were here pretty often. Mm -hmm. And they kept coming back and you know each time the concerts got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and now you know they're playing stadium tours throughout the U.S. which very few artists can do you know you have to be you know someone who's you know when you when you consider who else is doing stadium tours in the U.S. they're either legacy acts or the people like Taylor Swift who I know I've been listening to since I was in high school and like she was already at the top of her game well I guess she has wasn't at the top of her game, but she was already a, considered a top star. Mm-hmm. And only so many people can hold these sort of tours. Only so many people can do it. And I think because they kept kind of saying, we'll be back, we'll be back and meant it. They, they showed not only fans, but also um, like the industry. If you put out the concert, people will come. People want to support you. People will be your fans. And I think that it was a really important it's a it's an important bond between artists and audience to kind of say we'll be there for you we're gonna be there literally in per in like physical person for you but to perform because we understand that you want to kind of see us in person like you want you want to engage with us more than you can just through the limitations of like the digital life we have now so when they started touring I think I think kind of building that connection between artists and fans happened really naturally and really um, almost intensely. Like very, when you went to a BTS concert in the early days in the US or when you saw them perform, like I saw them perform several times at KCON, the bond was there because, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, I'll see them, you know, now and it's the only time in my entire life I'll see them, I'll see them maybe next year, I'll see them maybe in you know six months or something. That, that bond is, I think one of the things that is something beautiful between an artist and, and fans, you know, there, there are artists who don't necessarily have fans. There are artists who maybe they're very, I mean, they don't have a fandom necessarily. They have may have fans, but they don't necessarily seek out the audience that, you know, understands them best that puts time and effort into engaging with them. They kind of are just, you know, um, not, not, I'm not saying this in a bad way, but someone who comes to mind is Adele, who, you know, everybody loves Adele, but not, not everybody is necessarily like, I don't even know Adele's fandom name offhand. Like, you know, it's not like Swifties or Barb's or Army. Like, you don't, you don't have the same sort of bond with the other people. But if you're going to concerts, you probably have your concert friends and you probably, you know, create a community around this. And I think uh, K pop is an idea so much of it nowadays is about the communal element and people really engage with each other because this is something that they love. And, you know, music fans around the world have have done this for ages. Um, If anybody wants to read a really good book that kind of explores like why boy band fandoms and boy bands exist, you can read Maria Sherman's new book, Larger Than Life, which is really good. Uh, And she kind of explores like how far back this idea of like music fans 
joining together over particular male musicians is just so important to like the sociology of you know modern women's like interaction with pop culture hmm. anyway that's kind of a like a, a, a little segue like a little you know aside but I think that this there's almost this promise of we're going to tour we're going to come back this and it's not just a promise because they were coming back and they were touring in the U.S. was something that really helped solidify their audience here you know fans could say oh I'm going to watch their music video oh and they're coming next month I'll go see them and I think that it, it was almost like if you see us and you come to our concerts, we'll keep being there for you. And even though that's not, you know, I mean, said point blank, I think it was a really important part in why particularly American fans kind of found it. Like it's also, you know, we hip hop is huge right now in the US. So if you have a group that kind of fills all those spaces, you know, people who like hip hop will like some of their music and people who like pop will like some of their music and people who are boy band fans will like them because in America, we only ever have one boy band, unless you're like in that weird era of like Backstreet Boys and singing at others. Yeah, <laughs> um, but pretty much only there can only be one on top. And uh, BTS kind of really for so many reasons that you know uh, even I wrote a whole book and I don't even think like I touched on all the reasons. And there's gonna be so many more books that I think explore this throughout you know the history of books <laughs> um, I, that I hope explore this. I think. I just think there's so much there. So then in October 2016, we're still in 2016. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Wings, including the song Blood, Sweat and Tears, which your book is named after, um, was a breakthrough again, especially in the U.S. Then in 2017, August of 2017, they launched the Love Yourself era. Um, there were three albums, Her, Tear, an answer. And this is when they really, I think, started to break into quote unquote mainstream of America, um, mainly because they were appearing in things like award shows and um, talk shows. Um, and then 2018, Love Yourself Tear, which was the first Elva album by a Korean act to top the American charts, followed by Love Yourself, the map of the soul persona, all within one year topping the charts. Um, and then there was a map of Soul 7, as you mentioned, which came out in February of 2020. And we hear the news that they're coming out with a new song next week, correct? Okay. It's called Dynamite. So there are so many complicated things that we can talk about, obviously. But there are a couple of things that I want to sort of um, zero in on. And we've been talking a lot about Big Hit and Pang Siok and their influence on their career. and. Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about the team behind the BTS because when we talked with you last summer for our program, A Decade of K-pop, we had talked about the three major entertainment um, that you mentioned that really dominate the K-pop business for a long time, SM Entertainment, YG, and JYP. And we did talk about how BTS was not produced by this, the, one of the big threes, but by a much smaller company, Big mm -hmm. Hit. So if anybody's interested, it is available on YouTube. <laughs> um, in, so in what ways do you think, and we, you, I think you've talked a lot about how Tang Xiao really influenced sort of their, um, the, the creation of BU and um, help, you know, uh, BTS members to go through that. And BTS also works with a lot of the musicians and um, writers to do this. Um, in what ways the sort of the members relationship with Big Hit, you think, diff differ from other artists with their companies? Um, what was different about Big Hit's management of BTS when you compare it to other K-pop bands? Because they must have done, I mean, they must have done something a little different because, uh, just to see how successful it is. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't know if there was a grand plan or if it's yeah. something they... <laughs> figured out as they went along, probably combination of two um, and many other um, factors. But do, do you see anything that is very different about the relationship between Big Hit and BTS? Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't necessarily see something um, so different between the relationship between BTS and, mm -hmm. and, and Big Hit and you know other companies because a lot of other artists also you know have quite familiar relationships with their teams and their CEOs. But I think 
um, when I think of what is now probably, so when we talk about like the big four K-pop company, I'm oh, sorry, the big three K-pop companies, those are kind of SMJYP and YG, which have all been, have gone public. They're, you know, been pretty dominant. And I, I, I don't, anyone quote me on this, but tonight there is going to be, or tomorrow in Korea, there's going to be um, a, a big event that uh, big, big Hit is happening. And the the assumption is, is that they're going to be announcing that they're going public and going to be having an IPO. And so that's kind of, um, it's going to become a big four blatantly because of that. But um, I think the thing that kind of each of the companies of now, hopefully the big four um, are go do is they each kind of have their own, I want to say like a vibe or a feeling to them. So if you think about it, like SM Entertainment is all about kind of using technology and how you engage with artistry like you would some like like the whole idea of of SM's theory is that you know their founder was uh, I think he was an engineer and he was like how do we take the idea of making artists like the way that you make you know a computer or something like you always improve on the next generation um, other companies like YG is the whole basis of them is you know just blatant hip-hop uh, and then you have JYP where kind of they don't necessarily have a, a like a theme or something, but they kind of have like this very cozy, familiar, comforting vibe to them. You know, the whole company's corporate um, like persona is that it's a, it's a family. Everybody gets along really well with each other. Everyone, you know, um, today Sun or yesterday Sunmi and the founder JYP released their new song together, even though she's no longer at the company. Like the idea is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a relaxed, comfortable place and they're going to do it well. And I think that big hits vibe, <laughs> there is a point to this, is the artistry. Like the artistry is the key here. So we're going to, you know, be a company and we're going to put out, you know, high quality content, just like all these other ones are. But at the end of the day, we want, you know, not just oh, some fans to like it or, you know, to use these um, artists to kind of figure out how we can keep on building this sort of artistry, but just how do we, how do we relay this and how do we get people engaged? So I think to me, this is just my personal interpretation. That's kind of what sets Big Hit apart is kind of like the goal is how do we get these artists and their thoughts and our thoughts that we have and stories we want to tell and do it in a way that we can, you know, um, at the end of the day, to create art, you need money, you need funding. So how do we do well, this in a way? <laughs> to create a successful, successful band and you know, that will create yeah. successful brand. I mean, because really Big Hit, um, BTS at this point is probably the one of the biggest um, brands. So that's the team behind the BTS. Mm -hmm. And when we also talk about BTS, we cannot not mention the incredibly dedicated and passionate mm -hmm. fans of BTS. And as I mean. you know, they are known as ARMY. And um, I have to confess, I knew they were called as ARMY. Everybody calls them ARMY. BTS calls them ARMY. They call themselves ARMY. I didn't know what it stood for until <laughs> I read your book. So what does ARMY stand for? Stands for Adorable Representatives, oh. MCs. Of youth. Of, youth. Um, of youth. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> um, like, so it, like, it's like army as singular. So you are an army, right? You are um, an army. Yeah, it's kind of a hard thing to say as a singular, but. <laughs> but, and they are truly, you know, one of the main forces behind this um, phenomenon that is BTS. Um, and then in recent months, um, some not just the army, I should say, actually, it's, um, there has been some media attention about the K-pop stands, as they are known, mm -hmm. as they became very vocally involved in, should I call it social activism online, mm -hmm. um, all the things they were doing um, as part of the protest or other issues that um, facing, you know, that we are all facing, um, which you also, I have to say, started with um, very, deliberate, I, I think, um, action from BTS themselves when they donated a million dollars to Black Lives Matter. Um, but the K-pop stands, which includes ARMY, has mm -hmm. been very um, active online, um, not just about their favorite artists, obviously, but something they believe in. And I really, and there has been lots of news coverages about um, yes. very many thoughtful, and some of them very thoughtful pieces about 
why this is the case. So I want to, and I, I know that you are quoted in one of the articles. So I, and I really like what you explained about, because everybody is asking, so is it because K-pop stands are more liberal? Are they just more, you know, you know, awoke or they are more interested and what, why is it? And I think that's something we always wonder too, like who are these young people growing up <laughs> listening to music they probably not really understand word by word um mm -hmm. and then they really get into it and then they can sort of express themselves because i think in a sense fandom is all about expressing yourself as mm -hmm. well right um and they choose this very particular um group of people and, and bts being the most popular obviously um to express themselves so what does that say about the k-pop stands <laughs> yes yeah, so i i think the article you're referencing i think is the i spoke to time um about this whole topic and you know the at the end of the day it comes down to fans are humans so even prior to bts's donation you know in certain fandom corners of so, like twitter and instagram and stuff people who identify or are considered k-pop fans were already engaging you know with black lives matters and other social activism moments you know, you'll often see people kind of rallying around certain moments in k-pop spaces because they're people so you everybody everybody is bringing their own personal um you know life experiences and thoughts into their fandom and, and you know we're all coming from across the world um you know k-pop fans are every age race creed you know the, there's the idea that uh, k-pop fans are typically female oftentimes young but it, it's not that's not the whole picture you know it's it's like we're a, we're a beautiful you know i don't know medley of of people and even though like the predominant the fandom is generally considered predominantly fan uh female um ages and race and genders and you know every we come from every walk of life so for what i think the recent you know surge from media attention was kind of because a, people are home. <laughs> so people have more time to spend not only in fandom communities, but also talking about things that they kind of um, care more. You're not getting kind of distracted by, you know, running around and living your life like maybe people usually do. But also you have um, things like Black Lives Matters. It wasn't just it's in K-pop communities that it was getting elevated attention than it ever has in the past. It's because, you know, it was elevated beyond any previous discussion we've had about this topic in and Black Lives Matters after the murder of George Floyd and after murder of Breonna Taylor and it kind of all rallied. So K-pop fans rallying around this and BTS um, donating and then ARMY rallying around that to match a million in a day, it kind of just makes sense because these fans have great, you know, they have great communication skills within their communities and they have great ways of organizing within their communities. So to do that, it just kind of is like, it's like the, the you know the personal moments of people's lives and their personal thoughts kind of rallied and meshed with their fandom lives and we saw something similar with um president trump tulsa rally when uh k-pop fans and tiktokers kind of you know spread it around like oh goodbye like get reserve tickets to this rally and you know it's going to be empty and people you know it, it's kind of very you know it's it's always funny because people um, and fan cam activism kind of like filling police radars and, and um, or police apps and, you know, uh, white supremacist hashtags with K-pop right. fan cams. Um, there was a lot, there was so much going on, you know, and to even some degree, some of those kind of resulted in, well, I don't really want to see, you know, White Lives Matters trending. So is this really kind of working right. so perfectly? Uh, but I think that it was kind of, you know, even that imperfection of kind of how do you achieve your goals is kind of reflective of what was going on, which is that people, our fans and people were coming together and rallying around these ideas and they were using their fandom behaviors to kind of propel it to new heights. So yeah, yeah. I think it was, I think it was beautiful. And I think what we'll, hopefully we'll see more of this, you know, yeah. K-pop fans have a long history of donating and rallying together, but K-pop in general kind of, you know, you, I don't know for most cases, um, most fans, uh, not me, I'm, my face is on Twitter, but most fans, if you're anonymous, you might not know what someone else's life experience has been unless they tell you. So you don't necessarily know if someone shares the same values as you. You don't know if somebody feels the same way you do, but things like Black Lives Matters and 
you know, certain political situations in the United States might very much resonate with a lot of people. So you can kind of rally the most support because you all agree with the same thing. It's not to say um, by and large, you know, younger people tend to be more liberal. So if a fandom is predominantly, you know, seen as being younger, you're going to feel that the fandom is more liberal. But just people who, you know, it's not to say that K-pop fans or ARMY specifically are more liberal than the general population. They are the general population. So just like the activities that kind of show themselves are more aligned with general trends and general themes of the moment. So I think um, when it comes down to it, K-pop fans, you know, you always have to remember that fans are people too, and they bring their life experiences to their fandoms. And I think it was, it was something really extraordinary to see what was going on, you know, a yeah. few weeks ago and yeah. what I imagine we'll see again. Absolutely. Um, so I'm go- I want to end with, as you mentioned, BTS recent Bang Bang concert, uh, Bang Bang Con mm-hmm. digital, virtual concert which was considered a huge success. Again, like I think they claimed that it had a record viewership for online concerts. Um, we are certainly living through unprecedented times and I am tired of saying that. I don't want to live through <laughs> unprecedented time anymore. But, um, and performing arts is one of the sectors that's really affected by this current pandemic and the new norm of social distancing, which we probably need to keep for foreseeable future um but do you think this recent event can tell us anything about the future of online concert or how um the artists can still continue to communicate with their fans yeah i think um i think uh bang bang come the live had i don't remember the exact number but i'm pretty sure it was over seven hundred thousand, which means you're getting for one performance you know almost you're you're in the range of getting to a million people watching you at one time and paying tickets for like to watch you and so you can't really ever emulate that in a live venue there's there's no venue in the world that will fit over 700,000 people that's just impossible so i think the you know we we talked a little bit about briefly about the importance of touring for bts's career and that connection between artists and fans and so right now when we are lacking you know the interpersonal connections because of these unprecedented times, sorry, um, because of these times that we all are living through, something like Bang Bang Con can kind of act as a reminder of the connections that we have built with other people, you know, through music, through concerts, and also because it's K-pop in general is a very digital forum, you know, a lot of not, most people don't necessarily engage with it, the content live because unless you're in a major city that gets these tours, you're probably not seeing them live unless you know you're going out of your way to see them. So K-pop kind of transitioning to digital holy concerts that are wholly digital makes a lot of sense. So I think Corona in a way is creating a new um, uh, like revenue stream for K-pop. And I think many, maybe other artists will do too, but for K-pop, a big complaint, you know, by fans is you don't go to enough countries. You don't go to enough cities around the countries that you do go to. Maybe you don't go to enough continents, you know, very, you know, very few artists go to Latin America and even fewer go to Africa or like, um, you know, um, like India, you know, there's a whole huge scopes of the world that never get K-pop artists. So I think something like these concerts, not only are they great for Corona when we kind of want to be reminded of those moments in our lives that are so beautiful and so impactful and so empowering, the feeling of being at a concert. Um, And I think it can also expand beyond it because now, you know, not everyone gets to experience live a concert from their favorite star, but now you can experience a live and you can experience it at the same time with your friends. Like even prior to Bang Bang Con, the live, BTS did Bang Bang Con, which they just, you know, streamed their, their um, concerts. And, um, you know, even just doing that, getting to watch those concerts with my friends and like everybody else on the internet was so fun. It was so engaging. It just kind of reminded us of, you know, remind me personally of, you know, the experience, the shared experience that concerts have. And so I think by maybe continuing this, even just for Corona or whether beyond, I think it's a wonderful way to bring people together even while being apart, because you're, you know, living that thing simultaneously. It's kind of like, um, I know it's not like very popular nowadays, but watching a TV event live, you know, like everyone engaging with even, I guess, Game of Thrones finale probably was like one of the last really big ones where it felt like everyone you knew was watching it. And if you weren't, you were really like, 
you have to watch it otherwise you're going to get all the spoilers on social right media. like <laughs> right um so those sort of existences are kind of rare nowadays but these online concerts give you that so even if i'm across the world you know um this weekend it was um, two concerts happened the same night so monster x is and then twice and i was texting friends throughout as i was watching them and it's like oh my gosh it's almost like i'm sitting next to you at a concert and you know yeah. it's 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 a way to bring people together and to bring people um new content and to kind of um engage you know in a, in a time when we're all disengaged um, from real life but very engaged with media so I think uh the the bang bang con the live was you know I I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of this from BTS and other artists because you know it was so it was like so wonderful to see you know they could try things out that you know maybe they couldn't try at a concert like um not bang bang con the live necessarily but other ones that I've seen have you know used CGI in a way that you can't possibly use at a physical event and so you're kind of trying out this art form kind of like evolving because of the experimental state of it because this mm. world is kind of in an experimental state of existence so yeah I think it's something that's really uh, wonderful to see we're seeing you know k-pop in general kind of um, engage with online concerts pretty much more than any other industry, any other music industry counterpart is really kind of jumping into. And it's, I think it's because in general, you know, so much of um, K-pop and, you know, specifically ARMY is the engagement that you engage like with the artists and each other online. So having these online concerts is kind of just another step of, you know, the, the fandom life. So I think there's something really uh, positive about it. And you know, I do want to go to concerts sometime soon, but um, in the meantime, I think it's a good alternative. And we always have so much to talk about with you <laughs> and one hour is never enough, but that's all we have for now. <laughs> but thanks again, Tamar, for joining us to get, uh, uh, today and we wish you all the best. Congratulations on the book. Did you show your book? Thank you. I yeah. realized I didn't. No. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. There it this is. is a book. It's there it cute. is. And all their names are on it. Or there are all their names are on it. And there are lots of pictures. But most importantly, you're writing about this extraordinary <laughs> group of um, seven young men. Um, you can order BTS Blood, Sweat, and Tears from wherever you order your books. Um, mm -hmm. Go to our website, kriasociety.org, if you want more information regarding this book or our annual dinner where BTS yes. will be the very special one of one of many special guest but um <laughs> special thanks to peter our it director for making this live webcast possibility and to our intern extraordinary ordinary gia i could not have done this interview without <laughs> her for um all her questions and doing all the social media postings and of course our thanks to you our members and viewers we hope you will join us again next week um or actually in a couple couple of weeks. Um, check out what's coming up on our website, kriasociety.org, where you can sign up to receive our emails or join us as a member. And make, sh make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any of the upcoming programs. So good night. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. <laughs>